So I'm going to talk about, uh, provide some foundational information about dams, and Jeremy's going to talk about some of the research that we've been doing on some dam removal sites. Oh, yes. So <clears throat> I work for the Hudson River Estuary Program, which is a partnership between WRI and New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. I coordinate a, a watershed management program uh, with a great team of people, some of which are on the phone today on this on this webinar. But today I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna define this is a, the, the presentation outline for today is I'm gonna talk about what a dam is, provide some facts about dams, their impacts, um, a couple case studies, and then I'm really here to, like I said, to prime um, Jeremy's talk. So Brian mentioned the Hudson River Estuary program. Um, I want to put a brief plug into the program overall is much bigger than the talk that I'm providing. You've heard some from some other folks in the past and will be in the future about other parts of our program. Um, our program has an action agenda. It's uh, basically a strategic plan for five years. We're coming up on ending um, our current strategic plan in a year or so. And we'll be creating a new one, but currently um, these are the, the issues that we address uh, in our action agenda and through partnerships with uh, with local partners, regional partners. Um, I must say for the work that I'm doing today, um, some of the work that I that I do, it can't be done without um, nonprofits like Riverkeeper, uh, the Hudson Valley Streams Conservancy, certainly the dam owners, um, Soil and Water has played a part, DEC. It's a host of partners that that allow this work to go forward. Um, so our program, the Estro program, works on the Hudson River itself and the ecosystem of the Hudson, the fisheries, the habitats, um, clean water. The another chapter that we have is a thriving and resilient watershed, and that's where this project kind of falls under healthy tributaries. But we do do other work related to climate change and conserving natural resources. And we also have a programs that focus on recreation education on the Hudson River. And like I said, you'll be hearing from other people throughout these the series of this webinar that are focused on those other parts of the program. So I'll start by asking people, what did the fish say when he swam into a wall? Um, Rewa, I think you know the answer. Ouch. Oh, damn. Damn. <laughs> All right, so I hope by the end of the talk, you realize, though, that uh, dam removal and the reasons for removing dams is not limited to fish passage, but that tends to be where much of the funding is focused. Um, the construction money, as well as the planning and engineering, it's on passing fish and getting fish moving upstream. But um, the reason to remove dams is plentiful and, and more than just fish passage. So how do we define a dam? Um, essentially, it's a structure that's put in the middle of a stream that stops or restricts the flow of water. It creates an impoundment. Um, there's usually a defined inlet and outlet, although I've seen situations where that isn't always the case, but I would say the vast majority of cases. And dams, dams and their impoundments come in various sizes and configurations. So this is just a schematic of a typical dam and a stream and what happens. So here's some clear examples of what dams look like. Everyone can agree these are dams and people know what they that they look like a uh, dam they might have seen in the newspaper or on or somewhere. But they also look like this. Um this is an example of a of a dam. This is what it looks like in aerial view. So I'm providing a couple pictures here. This pond is was taken right up here. You wouldn't necessarily know that was a dam if you were walking through the woods, unless you were looking for it and you were trained to think about looking for dams. They also look like this. And how about that one? You wouldn't think that's a dam, but it is. And you would walk maybe right over that and think it was a bridge or something if you weren't trained to be looking for them, for it. And I also want to say that dams are not waterfalls and there's quite a bit of misconception out there in the public about dams and waterfalls being similar, but they're not. So I uh, <clears throat> well, I feel compelled to mention that um, 
dams are not forever structures. They're pieces of infrastructure that are put in streams that don't last forever. So you really have kind of three scenarios moving forward with a dam. Either it's maintained by the owner in you know, perpetuity, the dam can still fail in that case. The dam is removed in a controlled fashion or the dam eventually fails in an uncontrolled fashion. Um, you know, dams serve a purpose in our society. They provide recreational opportunities. They provide drinking water and flood attenuation in some cases. There's a quite a bit of misinformation about that out there about dams, small dams in particular, providing flood control. The vast majority of dams do not provide flood control. There is a very small percentage of those. And if they're a flood control dam, they're empty um, most of the year. They're, they're actually served to fill up during a storm as opposed to keeping um, holding water. And I have a picture of a, um, a symbol of a, a town seal here. I just kind of rem remind us that they, they do provide some historic value to, to people. Um, can't imagine trying to remove this dam in this town. Uh, where the mill was on the town seal, but uh, that was kind of, we run into those cases where the, the dam is actually important historically to the town. So how many do you think are out there? Uh, there are thousands, upwards of maybe 6,000 in New York State that we know about that the state regulates, manages, inspects, and there's a requirement on you know, on behalf of the landowner or the dam owner to maintain and maintain that structure safely. Yeah. But there's a lot more small ones. Um, this was based on some research that Brian Buchanan and some others, including me, worked on on identifying smaller dams. Yeah, um, and we found, to no one's surprise, that there were more dams out there. So I have uh, the, the the known dams that, that, that we know that they exist based on the DEC's inventory. And then these were the ones that were unmapped. And you can see there's quite a few more in each of these watersheds. This is the Foundry Brook and Latin Town Creek. They're both tributaries of the Hudson River. Um, the age of the dams um, in New York State, average age about 85. Um, and when you think about 50 years being there kind of service life when they were built, they were thought to provide a service life and design life for about 50 years. They're exceeding that. So they are yeah, no. they are in some cases in disrepair. Oftentimes uh, an a deficiency is their spillway capacity. This is an example of a spillway that has eroded and the stream is cutting down through that spillway. Yeah. Who owns the dams? Well, primarily it's private owners followed by local government. Often, I think there's a misunderstanding that uh, dams are owned by the government, but in most cases, they're privately owned in New York State. And I just provided a couple maps here of, you know, this could be one owner, a single private owner. It could also be, to the right, uh, a private owner of a homeowner association or a business. It could be multiple owners, right? All these, in this case, all of these homeowners through a homeowner association own the dam on this lake. Why remove them? Well, they, they fundamentally shift the stream from a stream to a pond, right? They disrupt uh, the river continuum. They impound sediments. They impede flow and debris. Like I said earlier, and through my the cartoon, they're they're a uh, a block or a, a barrier to uh, movement of aquatic life upstreams oftentimes they can impact water quality such as okay. allowing the water to bake in the sun increase water temperature decrease oxygen they provide opportunities okay. have as harmful algal blooms sorry for not defining that um, they provide opportunities for harmful algal blooms they can they can facilitate invasives to move in there are risks to recreational users coming down the river and going over them. There are liabilities for owners. There are flood risks if they fail. They also increase the flood elevation upstream. There's a whole host of impacts that dams have on rivers and communities um, beyond fish barriers. 
So dam removals in New York and neighboring states. This is from American Rivers. And I didn't ask myself. Uh, the map on the right shows the number of dams that were removed from since they started keeping records, essentially, where they, the records uh, go back to 1912. New York State removed 46. You can see neighboring states like Pennsylvania are going gangbusters, removing many more. There were two dams that I could find that were removed last year in New York. Both were on the Sar Saranac River in Plattsburgh. This is an example of a recent dam removed in the Hudson Valley. Um, the pictures, but we've removed a few others, and there's there's some others on the horizon. And, and this, the pictures represent kind of the flow of what happened, right? We we found this actually. Riverkeeper kind of notified us about this gate that was uh, called a tainter gate. It, it's like a hinge, right? It, it hinges up and down. It was used for industrial water at some point in the past. <laughs> well, we gave them a grant. They came in. They used an excavator. They removed the dam. The dam is gone. And now there's fish. And this fish is held up by a, a biologist, uh, Bob Schmidt. I think it was the first herring that was caught above that dam for more than 85 years. They they moved in right away, the, the, the fish in this case, the herring, migra migrating fish. It's a picture of before and after of a dam removed in the city of Newburgh with Riverkeeper, Quasay Creek. Jeremy's going to talk about this quite a bit. I think today, um, or at least mention it, uh, we removed a dam in uh, Dutchess County with the town of Clinton Corners, the private owner, and Dutchess Soil and Water. We did some monitoring pre and post in that dam and were able to uh, observe some positive changes in the stream and got a uh, success story out of that project that validated that we actually improved um, the stream. This is another example of a, a dam failure. You can see the there's no water being impounded behind this dam. The water flows this from right to left. And here's an image of what it looked like after the water began to basically seep through the structure. So it failed. It's no longer impounding the water the way it should. And I think uh, someone, George Jackham, might have coined this phrase, McKinney Forest. So we went in and we provided restoration of the of the trees and shrubs in this floodplain to try to restore the vegetation back in the impounded area behind the dam. And this is just a picture of what that looks like while we're doing the project. Trees for Tribs, we have uh, in our in our program, trees for tributaries, and that's what it looked like I think after year one. So I just wanted to throw up some pictures of places that I've observed or people have observed and sent me pictures of um, dams that have failed or been removed, I suppose. But I think these are all kind of <clears throat> natural failures of dams. They happen. And I wanted to point out that we we have developed some films, some short films, um, both at DEC and uh, a couple of these are Riverkeeper films. Two of these are Riverkeeper films. One of these is a DEC film that you might want to watch about dam removal. And Rewa said she would pop those into the chat so you have the ability to, before the end of the presentations, um, you don't need to do it right now, Rewa. And thanks for listening. I'm done. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jeremy. Thank you. So my name is Jeremy Diedrich. I'm a principal aquatic ecologist in the Department of Natural Resources um, at Cornell University. And I'm going to be discussing the ecological outcomes of uh, barriers and dam removal in the, in the Hudson River estuary. Uh, so first of all, I just want to acknowledge the, the project support and the funding that um, you know, is, is responsible for helping us uh, achieve uh, a lot of these uh, restoration goals. Um, a largely collaborative effort between uh, the New York State Water Resource Institute, um, the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell University, and, um, you know, Scott mentioned the, the State Department of Environmental Conservation and, uh, you know, the Hudson River Estuary Program. 
Um, so I'm going to uh, divide the stock roughly into four um, parts. First is a an introduction, um, kind of some stream ecology 101 to to fully uh, recognize and, and understand the uh, the impacts that dams have on the landscape. We need to uh, remind ourselves of how are streams supposed to work and what is their their natural condition. Um, a summary on kind of the national and state barriers that are on the landscape and removal progress. And I'll go through that uh, pretty quickly since a lot of that's gonna be um, redundant to what Scott uh, uh, set up initially. Um, then uh, summarize kind of some of the status of, of dam removal science to date. Um, how are we, uh, you know, conducting ecological, you know, experiments and studies to, to um, increase our knowledge of how dam removal uh, uh, responses occur, um, you know, highlight some ways in which, you know, barriers alter the natural conditions of the, the streams should, um, you know, kind of be uh, their natural state and um, articulate uh, some knowledge gaps and research needs that are um, present in the, in the in the literature. Um, and then uh, the latter half of the slide is going to be focused on the research program that we've, the collaborative research program that we've developed here um, and, and implemented, um, you know, in the New York, uh, you know, in the Hudson River Estuary. So, overview of, of the monitoring program to date, um, you know, demonstrate how dams are impacting tributaries on the ground in the Hudson uh, estuary. Um, and then highlight two dam removal case studies, um, you know, to outline how, you know, removals have improved aquatic systems. And then uh, briefly conclude, um, uh, you know, with, Kind of a summary of, of what we've discovered uh, in regards to dam removal benefits and some uh, uh, previews into to future you know, research uh, to help management um, you know, resource managers. So what we have to recognize originally is that streams, you know, are, um, you know, were once entirely connected kind of original connectivity from headwaters to deltas and that uh, is you know, important because at the watershed scale, each zone of kind of a river's course has, uh, you know, unique attributes that, um, you know, collectively contribute to, you know, to its, um, you know, ecological, uh, you know, functioning. So generally the upper third of the watersheds in the source zones uh, are steeper sloped, heavier forest, you know, more contiguous forest. Um, you know, you have a lot of erosion, you have higher water velocities that supplies um, a lot of the sediment and the habitat, in stream habitat um, substrate that is uh, broadcast throughout the length of the river. Um, you have a lot of uh, nutrients that come in in that upper third. Uh, most of it's, again, heavily forested. You have uh, leaf litter inputs, dissolved organic matter inputs, and, you know, and these are captured or collected. Uh, you know, within these upper thirds of, of watersheds, and that's what provides um, much of the resource base that organisms uh, use throughout the rest of the watershed. Um, kind of the middle middle uh, segments of streams and rivers are kind of a transfer zone. You have this, um, you know, the water velocity starts to slow down. You have a, a combination of erosion and deposition, uh, depositional processes occurring within the stream. Um, and uh, at the very lower reaches, the uh, kind of the deposition zone, you know, a lot of that sediment transfer is deposited, it's, it's stored. Um, and something to, it's important to recognize that uh, while some of these kind of entire stream systems, um, you know, appear like obviously this is just a little diagram, but, you know, in real life can be quite geographically um, expansive. Uh, you know, with at least in context in the Hudson Hudson Valley, um, you know, after a big rain event, you know, we all see the water kind of goes up into, you know, either flood stage or sub flood stage. Um, you know, water velocities, you know, in those elevated conditions can easily reach 
four or five feet per second, which um, is carrying all that source material through the rest of the stream. And three or four feet per second translates into about 65 miles per day. So in the Hudson Valley, after a heavy rain, within two or three days, you know, all the source material, if unobstructed, can uh, provide those resources throughout the entire uh, length of these streams. So even though um, certain section, segments of streams might seem geographically isolated, you know, they're all very inter interconnected uh, by, the, by the stream networks. Um, so just some, some basic principles. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, you have resource and sediment transfer occurring. Um, forested headwater sections provide abundance uh, uh, and diversity of leaf litter. Um, this abundance of litter uh, provides nutrient resources for organisms throughout the stream. Um, the diversity of that litter in a, in a, in a heavily forested um, uh, you know, area uh, provides different types of litter that kind of stabilizes you know, the annual food resource um, inputs kind of throughout the, the year um, because upper reaches in the watershed uh, are you know higher gradient there's more erosion they provide much of the um, you know the sediment diversity that you see throughout the remainder of the of the reach and a lot of that is um, those resources and, and, and sediment and nutrients you're all commute uh, cumulatively end up in the in the you know the lower reaches and deltas and are stored in those uh, certainly in, in the case of the Hudson estuary, yeah, we know generally that deltas uh, you know, are areas of, of really high productivity, um, biological productivity, because you know they're the cumulative um, you know, result of, of many, many uh, you know, square miles of, of, of nutrient input that the stream carries throughout uh, the landscape. Um, some of these biological organizational uh, characteristics uh, are, were authored by um, Robin Vanote in the 1980s, uh, kind of coined the river continuum concept. Um, it basically says that biological organization in streams is determined by changing environmental, biological and physiochemical properties along longitudinal gradient. So whether that's photosynthesis, respiration ratios, resource inputs, as I mentioned, temperature, uh, water velocity, um, and so on the diagram on the right, um, the, you know, the upper reaches, for instance, are going to be narrower channel, um, heavier forest cover, so you have less uh, sunlight getting to the, the stream bottom, the channels, are, the, the water temperature is going to be cooler. Uh, you have lots of, of whole leaf litter coming into the stream, you know, that's going to influence the type of macroinvertebrate community that's, that's capitalizing on those coarse particulate organic matter resources. You know, you have cold water fisheries. As you come further down into the, the stream network, the channel widens, some more sunlight can get to the bottom. Um, the, you know, you're, that facilitates algal growth on the, uh, you know, the rocky substrates, which are maintained as rocky substrates, because again, you're, you know, you have higher water velocities. Um, you have aquatic macroinvertebrate organisms that are now taking advantage of that algal resource, you know, cool water fisheries. And then as you get farther to the, um, you know, the lower reaches, water velocity slows. A lot of that fine sediment uh, is deposited in this, and, uh, uh, you know, sandy, silty bottoms. Those are dominated by more uh, macroinvertebrate uh, you know, filters and collectors, you have phytoplankton and zooplankton that are able to, um, you know, populate in that reach, you know, that's usually dominated by warmer water, uh, you know, fisheries. Um, you know, an important point is, uh, not to get too much into the theory, but generally uh, the biological diversity is going to peak in kind of these mid-order stream reaches due to, you know, the thermal variation, you know, especially the diute, uh, thermal variation during the day, the dial temperature uh, differences um, that match 
the metabolic optimum of many species. So remember that, you know, fish and invertebrates, the primary, you know, animals in, in streams are exotherms. Their, you know, metabolic processes are going to be uh, correlated to, you know, the, you know, the temperature. And so um, generally, the greater temperature uh, 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 change over the course of a period of time um, essentially says that, you know, at some point during the day, you know, that temperature regime will meet most organisms most of the time. And so that's how you can populate, uh, increase your you know, local biodiversity. Um, you know, if you have, you know, minimal temperature changes, then you're restricted to species that, you know, have, have adapted to only operate under, um, you know, steam of, steam of therms that can only operate under, uh, you know, low temperature regimes. And that's going to re reduce your biodiversity. Um, and so, uh, you know, these these idyllic free flowing states are actually, uh, you know, quite in the minority uh, globally. Um, you know, human advancements have um, pretty much uh, impounded or restricted, you know, over 75% of, of the rivers globally. Um, you know, only 23% of rivers over a thousand kilometers remain uh, free flowing. Um, and those are largely restricted to remote regions uh, you know, of the globe, of the Arctic, the Amazon, and Congo, Congo basins. And so consequently, uh, you know, nearly 50%, you know, of, you know, globally of rivers, you know, are, are strongly impaired as a result of, of habitat fragmentation and connectivity loss. Um, again, as Scott mentioned, you know, there's always going to be, you know, service environmental trade-offs. Uh, dams do provide human benefits and services, electricity generation, water supply, flood control, recreational opportunities. Um, you know, and so it's it's worthwhile to to you know just remind and acknowledge that mostly what I'm going to be dealing with here are, are removal efforts focused on you know outdated, outmoded dams, such as like abandoned water power mill dams that were prevalent you know in early 19th century and those that are um, you know in failing condition and posing a safety risk. And so, um, again, is, uh, you know, uh, the a number of dams in, in the United States is, comp is compiled by the National Inventory of Dams by the U.S. Army Corps. Um, there's roughly, you know, 92,000, uh, you know, federal uh, emergency management agency does designated dams in the, in the contiguous U.S., but but these uh, figures, um, you know, the FEMA designations, you know, have if uh, dam height and impoundment threshold minimums, and so they overlook, you know, many many small dams, uh, you know, generally less than you know, twenty five feet. Um, and as Scott mentioned, the average uh, service life, I'm sorry, the average dam in the U.S. is around sixty years, you know, well above its its uh, you know anticipated service life. Um, and so in New York State, uh, the uh, dam inventory is compiled by the New York DC Office of Dam Safety. Um, there's about 6,000, as Scott mentioned, with an average year of 86 years. The, you know, the blue, uh, the larger state diagram with the blue dots represents the, you know, the FEMA, um, you know, like the national dam inventory. But again, you know, you, there's uh, thresholds that that, that the size thresholds that that has to meet, and so if you zoom in, what looks to be white space on the FEMA map here locally uh, around it, you can see, uh, according to the New York State inventory, that you know it's, it's well populated with many many small dams on the landscape. Um, within the Hudson River Basin, um, there's about 1,600 known dams, and uh, you know, and most of that. Um, infrastructure building kind of built out by the mid 1950s, um, and you know, however, even that's you know a vast underestimation. And Scott went over the the ghost dam um, principles earlier, so I'm not going to you know spend uh, another you know, more time on it. Um, again, similar to what Scott said, um, you know, through 2022, about 2,000 dams have been removed. And if we look at that as a time series, you can see that there's, 
you know, in your kind of exponential rate of removal in the past uh, roughly 20 years, um, you know, in large part due to, uh, you know, the aging cohort of a lot of these, uh, you know, 1800s, early 1900s cohort of the you know, colonial era water power dams, you know, that are in disrepair. Um, dam removals in New York State, 46 as of 2022, and that's dominated um, geographically kind of within the Hudson River estuary and Lake Champlain. Um, you know, as I think Scott mentioned, there's a couple on Saranac and Lake Champlain that came out, you know, the conservation goals within the Hudson River estuary focus on a lot of the um, oceanic migratory species that come into the estuary and up on Lake Champlain, there's increased conservation efforts towards um, restoring Atlantic salmon in, in Lake Champlain. So, um, Summary of uh, existing science. Um, so there's not, you know, dam removal can be um, opportunistic, but um, even at that, you know, less than two percent of, of removals um, are accompanied by a sci or by scientific study. Um, and so, you know, this figure uh, to the left, larger figure, you know, you can see the, you know, you know, with the, you know. Over a thousand dams removed, you know the um, cumulative number of studies is still, you know, like I say, you know, um, a few percent of that. Um, and uh, the subset um, uh, diagram, you can see that even though uh, small dams are vastly more prevalent on the landscape as the state inventory and the ghost dam um, figures show, there's they're they're well understudied compared to slightly larger um, structures. Uh, and uh, most of the, the studies that do occur of, of the 2% are generally within a year or two of the, the removal itself. Um, there's very few studies that actually look at longer term, either pre-removal or post-removal um, responses to dam removal, even though as many people May, may recognize, you know, ecological and geological or geomorphic processes, you know, can occur over decadal timescales. Um, so from the, uh, from the information that we do have from the existing studies, you know, we can kind of summarize what we know as to how, you know, dams are, um, you know, interrupting that original connectivity um, that, you know, of, of what the streams and the stream organisms and the processes have kind of all co-evolved with. So um, this was broadly um, promoted in, you know, kind of a seminal paper, the serial discontinuity concept or in Stanford in the early 80s. Um, and so, you know, you have low and mid-order streams that possess this, you know, greater, um, you know, longitudinal interactions So longitudinal is just, you know, kind of throughout the length of the stream. And, um, you know, if you just take kind of three components, uh, you know, they basically said if you place a dam kind of in, in these, you know, headwaters, middle reaches, lower reaches, how is that going to alter what, what would be the natural uh, connectivity state? Um, and I will uh, qualify that, that this paper assumes, you know, larger dams with like a, a cold water release uh, Kind of coming from the bottom, a hypoluminatic release from the reservoir. So you have a cold water you know, outflow as opposed to a surface, uh, warmer surface spill. Um, but, you know, again, you know, it's reducing this thermal heterogeneity. Uh, and most of our uh, uh, dams are, are focused kind of in these middle, middle orders. Um, and so, you know, you're reducing that thermal heterogeneity that's required for optimal biologic diversity. Um, you know, especially if dams are placed higher up in the watershed, kind of blocking that source zone that I showed initially, um, you're reducing a substantial amount of the net resource, nutrient resources that are, that are able to be broadcast through the stream to, to support, you know, streamwide ecosystems. And, um, you know, you're limiting biodiversity by blocking, uh, you know, connectivity, connectivity pathways. Um, so some examples of thermal alteration, um, you know, whether it's, it's a bottom release or surface spill, 
you know, both alter streams, thermal profile, um, you know, impounding this water reduces seasonal and diagonal thermal uh, heterogeneity. And, you know, this thermal alteration can persist well downstream of the dam, kind of referred to as like a dam shadow. So um, whether it's a, it's a cold water release, you know, kind of from the bottom of the reservoir, uh, an example to the left is uh, USGS temperature data from um, below the Cannonsville Dam on the upper West Branch um, of Delaware River, New York State. And you can see the, um, you know, the kind of mean daily temperatures throughout the, the, the warm summer growing season that right below the dam, I mean, there's almost no variation. And once you get, you know, 15 miles downstream, you know, is when you start to, you know, get your uh, kind of re re retain, um, recover kind of your, your thermal heterogeneity. Um, uh, you know, from a cold water, from a warm water perspective, even on smaller kind of surface spill runner river dams that, that impound water, um, Zydell looked at a number of small mill dam type ponds in, uh, in uh, Michigan and, um, you know, you know, you ended up with, you know, that pooling water warms, you know, a little uh, one and a half degrees Celsius on average, up to five uh, degrees C um, in certain circumstances. And that elevated temperature profile um, can extend, you know, kilometers downstream. So, um, you know, it's not just an acute uh, effect, like these, you know, putting up a dam is gonna affect, you know, well downstream of, of the actual structure. Um, interrupting sediment and nutrient sources. Um, so you, uh, you know, pooling water retain nutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen. This is proportion of annual um, nutrients and sediment retained in these in these uh, you know, heat maps. So you know, there's a substantial amount of nutrients that in sediment they're being trapped. They're being captured from that source zone and and not um, allowed to uh, promulgate through the, the remainder of the of the systems, and um, you know these fine sediments you know, accumulate behind dams and reduce in-stream habitat quality uh, by just creating poor you know fine fine uh, sandy bottoms. Um, fish passage, again, um, an example from the Fox River in Illinois. Um, the uh, the river flows north to south, so the Dayton Dam here at the bottom is the first dam, and you can see organisms are downstream of the dam. Um, you know, are absent upstream or mostly, um, and so you know you're blocking a, a lot of organisms um, entirely uh, that might have downstream species. You know, but even species that are found throughout the river, um, their movements are, are severely interrupted, um, and that is implications for spawning success and genetic diversity. You know, to play devil's advocate, you can have a silver lining with respect to, you know, restricting invasive and non-native species, but, um, you know, you, you know, the, the net detriment to everything else is, you know, uh, hard, you know, may or may not be worth it. Um, so quickly, um, stream ecosystems, you know, depend on natural dendritic connectivity which allows for nutrient provisioning, sediment supply and transport, organism movement. There are many dams on the landscape, severely reducing free flowing reaches. Dams and associated impoundments, you know, we show interrupt transport of nutrients to sediment and restrict or prevent movement of organisms, you know, reducing uh, availability of quality and certain habitats. Um, there's relatively few but growing scientific investigations surrounding dam removal and associated um, restoration outcomes and uh, but long-term studies over three years or more are, are generally rare. So with that in mind, you know, what have we learned through dam removal research that we've implemented uh, within the Hudson uh, estuary? So, um, you know, again, as I mentioned, the collaboration between uh, WRI, DEC, and Cornell uh, Department of Natural Resources, we began ecological monitoring in 2016 um, to date, we have a total of nine study sites uh, through last year, um, you know, that we collected data on. Uh, during that uh, span, uh, we have pre-removal data that we've collected um, over the course of 
one to four years per site, depending on the site, and that spans up to eight years. Um, we have two to four years of data collection um, it, across different sites, uh, which spans up to seven years you know, um, uh, period. And um, you know, it's worth noting there's wide variation in landscape kind of cover types. Uh, you know, among all of these study sites, so some are more urban areas, some are rural. Uh, you know, some are you know more agriculturally dominated. So, um, yeah, we have a total of five pre-removal uh, sites. Where we have pre-removal data only. Three that we have both pre and post removal, and then as Scott mentioned the wine and skill, where we only have post removal. Um, that's kind of an artifact of when we began the monitor and just just after the that uh, gate that Scott showed came out. So, um, and as he indicated, dams can vary quite widely in the Hudson Valley. Um, they can be a meter or two, like you know the one I kind of admit, uh, Mill Dam on Mill Creek or Browns Pond. Or they can be more imposing structures like the one at Stony Point um, on Cedar Pond Brook or, or Main Lane in Furnish Brook or on Furnish Brook. So the upstream impoundments that we observe uh, in the valley look, uh, you know, just as Scott said, you know, just like ponds. And if you just happen to, you know, intersect one of these, you know, maybe not exactly at the dam, you might just think it's, oh, it's a nice, it's a nice little pond. Um, but you know, it's deceiving because even though, you know, they look nice, they're you know, causing, uh, you know, substantial ecological disruption. Uh, downstream, of course, is, um, you know, is, is retained itself as, as, as a stream, but um, the fact that that dam has been there and is interrupting that natural um, long, large scale geographic connectivity, that, you know, there are detriments even downstream. So even though, um, you know, again, you look at it and be like, oh, it's a stream, you know, I don't see anything wrong here. Uh, you know, you dig a little deeper and, you, and there are um, implications for, for these structures on the bisecting our watersheds. So our, um, generally our, our, our techniques has been uh, kind of a replicate sampling technique where on the left, we have pre-removal, where we have an impoundment, we have upstream sample points that we access usually by canoe or small boat. Um, you know, and, and then downstream, where, you know, we retain the, the stream of the load of habitat. You know, we set uh, cross-channel transects to collect uh, numerous uh, pieces of information. Um, uh, and then post-removal, you know, when that, when that impoundment's dewatered, you know, our downstream transect or, you know, um, is, you know, are, are maintained and then we uh, convert what was a sample point to a, a cross-channel transect, um, you know, for our, our post-removal monitoring. Um, the the orientation of these transect numbers goes with the, the direction of flow. So um, for some of the figures here, uh, you know, the you know, the number three upstream is the closest to the dam upstream and the number one downstream is closest to the dam downstream, just for kind of semantics. Um, so at our at our stream or loaded habitat sites, both pre and post removal, we collect site, we do a site assessment and, and record characteristics. We collect macroinvertebrates with um, kick sampling standard, uh, kick sam standard procedure in, in flowing streams um, across our, that, that channel of cross channel transect, we do a substrate assessment uh, using blind touch technique, and we survey um, the channel elevation to, um, you know, uh, index to a relative benchmark. Um, and then upstream, um, again, we take similar impoundment characteristics, depth, temperature, et cetera. Um, we, because we have fundamentally different, you know, habitats, uh, we employ, uh, you know, benthic, Ponar grab or a ponar grab sample benthic macroinvertebrates um, at the bottom of the impoundment and deploy um, multi plate samplers, which you can see here in the upper left picture, like a little invertebrate hotel we put in the water and you know leave it for a standardized period of time and the invertebrates you know colonize that and then we collect it and uh, you know assess what's what's you know coming through the top of the kind of the top of the water column like what's in the drift uh, coming from upstream. Um, and then we do a benthic sediment assessment 
as well using, uh, you know, essentially from the ponar grab and, and sieving it through different size sieves to capture, you know, proportion of sand, silts, their larger sediment. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these, um, in, you know, little pictures in detail here, but just uh, from the aquatic macroverba samples that we collect, we can derive quantitative biometrics, uh, all of which are uh, detail, detailed in the, uh, the state's biological monitoring of surface waters document. But um, just very generally, uh, from a from macroinvertebrate sample, you can take a particular metric. In this case, we'll call it species um, richness. Uh, with that value, uh, you can convert it to a kind of a normalized one through 10 water quality scale where you know, zero is bad and 10 is great. And so you can normalize to that same scale across different metrics with different conversion formulae. And then uh, from that water quality scale, you can assign a, uh, like an impact designation. Uh, there are four categories ranging from non-impacted, which is, you know, diverse macro, you know, water quality doesn't limit uh, fish propagation or survival, and you have a diverse macroinvertebrate community to severely impacted, which designates the water quality is poor and is limiting to both fish propagation and survival and reduces your invertebrate community to only a few tolerant species. And so that water quality scale, zero through 10 on the left, um, it's referred to as like the biological assessment score. And, um, you know, that's designated to those four, uh, you know, water quality impact categories uh, from a management perspective. Um, anything below five is considered you know, an impaired water body and, you know, may need you know, may require some level of, of, you know, resource management, you know, intervention, which of course takes time and personnel and resources to, to um, you know, to achieve. So what do we see for um, conditions, you know, that we have uh, where you have an impoundment, um, you know, positioned on a tributary in the Hudson River? So, um, from our pre-removal monitoring at, at our five sites and some of our uh, po pre and post sites, the common thread across is that you have these very disparate habitat conditions, you know, above and below the dam. So here at, um, you know, Cedar Pond Brook at Stony Point, which is the opposite of the city of Peekskill, Mill Creek, opposite Albany, up in Rensselaer, you know, so very wide geographic distances between these sites. But, you know, you can see the you know, the upstream site, you know, the upstream reaches are dominated by silt, sands, very soft sediments, and the downstream um, reaches are very, are much coarser sediments, bedrocks, boulders. And so you have this enormous habitat disparity literally within 20 feet of one another, um, you know, at, at each of these sites where you have, you know, a barrier in place. Um, you know, if you look downstream, um, and you look across that those those transects, you know the you know you see this downstream coarsening, you know um, of the of the of the substrate. So um, you know, and it, and it's across the stream. Um, so you know, the post and kill, uh, for instance, is pretty much dominated by by bedrock. Uh, Furnace brook below the dam is dominated by big boulders, large cobbles. And so, um, you know, once, as Scott mentioned kind of at the end there, you know, once you put up a dam, you know, and you interrupt that, those natural uh, transport processes, um, you know, you've disconnected the system. And so downstream, those smaller particles, the gravel, the sands, and fines, they're going to be you know, eroded and emigrated out due to the kind of the ambient erosive force of the water, but they're not replenished. You know, anything that would be replenishing them is trapped now behind the barrier. And so over time, you just have this increasing polarity, um, you know, between upstream and downstream habitat conditions. And, you know, they're consistent over time. So if we look at Furnace Brook, you know, we first did some, you um, uh, you know, early sampling to the 16, 17, 18, you know, 
it's an impoundment, it's silted in, it's, you know, we, we went back 2023, you know, it's still silted in, like there's been no mechanism to change that. And similarly, um, you know, within the downstream reach, you know, you've got the suboptimal, um, you know, coarse in-stream habitat that again, you've disconnected the system. There's no mechanism to change, um, you know, the habitat for, you know, either better or worse, depending on which side of the dam you're on. And so that's going to fundamentally influence aquatic macroinvertebrate community that's upstream um, within the impoundment. It's going to be as, you know, dominated by a few taxa, a very tolerant taxa, um, three sites, uh, you know, Cedar Brook, upstream, you know, Furnace Brook, Sawkill, um, upstream Annandale Dam, uh, you know, midges, oligochaetes, midges, oligochaetes, you know, Sawkill fares a bit better, but it's still 75% midges and oligochaetes, you know, very tolerant organisms that prefer soft, sandy, you know, soft, uh, you know, silt, sandy stream bottoms, you know, load, you know, can tolerate low dissolved oxygen um, and, you know, in higher water temperatures, um, but, you know, minimal bio biodiversity. Downstream, while you still have rocky substrates, um, you know, they're still impacted. And so the downstream each community is influenced by local site um, characteristics and qualities like, um, you know, the landscape context, ambient water quality. Um, and so, you know, you know, Mill Creek, uh, you know, and Brown Pond you know, are very coarse substrates downstream of those. And you can see that, you're, again, you're dominated by crustaceans and midges and, and worms. Um, you know, the Sawkill, Hill, uh, you know, fares a bit better in, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a loading system within a, a, a less impacted, human impacted landscape. So downstream can, can fare better, you know, if, if you give it a leg up, but it's still, um, you know, it's still impacted by the dam. And if you look at those, um, those biometrics, those quantitative biometrics that you can um, derive from these sites, you know, you can see wide, you know, wide disparity amongst amongst them as well. So, upstream is very different from downstream. And again, you get this arrested impairment throughout time. You know, there's no mechanism to to change what's going on. And so, if you just take the mean of a few upstream impoundments. You know, they're all severely impacted. And they're going to be severely impacted. Um, yeah, in, until you know, there's some fundamental change in, in the system. So. Um, interruption of sediment transport causes uh, deposition of finer substrates behind dams, creating suboptimal habitat. You know, you're reducing the macroinvertebrate community um, to, to poor, you know, low diversity of tolerant organisms, and you're degrading these communities. The, the degradation of these communities dec causes declines in water quality, you know, and limit uh, limits aquatic life uses. So, so what happens when we remove a dam? Um, there's two case studies, um, Chet Pond in Dutchess County, Strooksfeld, um, in Quisaic, very different landscape contexts, um, uh, and, you know, constructed for different purposes, but, you know, there's still dams on the landscape. Um, so Chet Pond, um, prior to removal was what we kind of would, would expect upstream, you know, basically a still water pond, downstream, you know, you have a stream, but coarser, coarser sediments. So um, the dam was removed, um, I think it's September in 2016. So about three or four months after, you know, we, we got our pre-removal data. And so, you know, what do you start to see? Well, first is you see this rapid emigration of finer substrates that, that have been trapped in the impoundment for, you know, in this case, about 50, 60 years. And so I'm um, just looking at the first riffle below Shat Pond. Uh, to the left, there's this deep backwater pool. There's always been a deep backwater pool. And uh, the next June after removal, you know, it's filled with with fine sand from what was in, in the impoundment. And, you know, you can kind of see through the glare of the water, you had coarser sediments in the main channel. 
that sand is starting to fill those um, particles. So you're restoring that natural transport connectivity to um, you know, improve the, the, the in-stream habitat. Um, and you can see just, you know, pre-removal on the left-hand side, you had very disparate habitat. Um, and within three years, you know, not quite a mirror image of each column, but you're homogenizing that habitat, you're improving it to a more optimal um, type of gravel cobble mix that uh, organisms uh, prefer. Um, and where's all that material coming from? You know, it, you open up the sediment transport. Um, you can see if you take these those elevations that we do across the channel, you know, each year, upstream of Shap Pond and the former impoundment, more and more materials being, um, you know, eroded out and, and transported downstream. And so if you if you look at it over time, uh, kind of quantitatively with particle size, you can see that, you know, prior to removal in 2016, again, very disparate types of, of habitat, or I'm sorry, of sediment, but, you know, they're by 2019, you know, they're converging to, um, it's kind of a local equilibrium based on you know restored hydraulic constraints. Mm -hmm. um, upstream of Shep Pond, you know, we saw dominance of, of lentic pond type organisms, worms, midges, aquatic worms, aquatic crustaceans. And then after removal, you know, you have the beginning of a restored community where mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies, beetles are recolonizing that space. And, you know, the, you have reductions uh, as those sandy uh, habitat goes away of your less preferred you know, worms, crustaceans, and, and to a degree, midges. Um, downstream, again, similar communities, but there are incremental, uh, you know, post removal improvements, um, you know, with increases in, in mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies, beetles, and reductions, uh, you know, in, you know, Look at Keats, aquatic worms you know, and crustaceans, your less less preferred um, uh, stream organisms. Um, you're, you're restoring like ecosystem functioning by providing improved resource partitioning. So how organisms feed um, is a way to uh, optimize like the resource partitioning and, and accumulation of biomass and streams, pre-removal. You know, it's dominated by these like collector gatherers, which are basically like vacuuming up the silt and, and biofilms on the sand. And post removal, you're seeing an expansion of more and more different types of feeding guilds within the, uh, the invertebrate community's habitat uh, is, is restored and resource petitioning within the system is becoming more efficient. Um, you're uh, again, your biometrics, which were kind of polarizing uh, prior to removal, begin to converge. Um, you know, most of the, you can see these after, um, you know, uh, after paired graphs upstream and downstream are kind of collapsing into each other. So, you're, you know, you're normalizing this reach, um, you know, for, for all these different metrics. And that's creating in, increase in water quality. Um, you know, that, that sustained over, you know, at least over the, the few years of, of, you know, that we have here, um, where you go from moderately impacted to only slightly impacted, um, but you cross that impaired water body threshold that, um, you know, exists uh, as far as, you know, management kind of focus. So, that, you know, it's nice to look at figures, but what does it actually mean in, in the landscape? So, um just two examples, like here's September 20, uh, 2016, about two weeks after the removal, you know, with the equipment out, and there's the same uh, stretch seven years later this past June, you know, unless you notice the, you know, the abutment on the left-hand side, you know, you'd almost not even know there, there was a dam there. You know, downstream, I showed you the first two pictures um, with the sand deposition, but you know now that's colonized and you're restoring riparian habitat um, that you know would have formerly just you know maintained itself as just like a, a frog backwater. Um, so another uh, dam example, um, Struke's Felt Dam um, came out in November 2020. Pre removal, we have you know, a smaller dam, but it's still a dam blocking connectivity for over a century. Post removal, a few years later, 
you know, an open, open reach. Um, we see, uh, again, a coarsening of habitat pre-removal upstream and downstream um, and post-removal, again, that gradual improve, a more gradual improvement, you know, in preferred substrate and, and channel habitat, gravel and cobbles. Um, why this hasn't improved more is, I'll uh, get to that potentially here in a second. Um, but again, uh, you know, you're opening up sediment transport, even if it's in within this local reach. Um, between 2021 and 2022, we can using our channel surveys, we can see the, you know, the channels incising above the dam. It's providing material that can be transported, you know, from the, you know, through the remainder of the of the reach of the river. Um, you know, again, we see uh, that this restored transport hydrology improves the macroinvertebrate community. Um, you have more caddis flies, you know, more mayflies, fewer aquatic worms um, than we did prior to removal. Um, and again, um, you know, the landscape context here uh, juxtaposed to, to Chapon, uh, you know, kind of suggests that, you know, how we set our expectations for removal, um, you know, is gonna matter uh, on the landscape the landscape context that the, the sites sit in. Um, and again, post removal, you know, instead of our nice big kind of arched line um, on uh, Chat Pond, it's, it's a more muted recovery um, here at, uh, on the Quasaic at Strokes Felt. You do edge above that, that moderate, you know, number five impairment line, but just barely, and you kind of asymptote uh, kind of there for a bit. Um, so again, there is an improvement, but I think again, setting expectations of how different barriers are going, or how re uh, recovery is going to respond across different barriers across different landscape contexts is is important. And you know, another reason why you know we might see reduced um, vigor of response in strokes felt is you know. It's one of many. So Strokes Felt Dam on the on the right hand side is the first dam upstream of the river, um, which is important for connectivity, but it's also the last dam in the system from upstream. And so, um, you know, you know, you're and and you're set in this you know very urban environment. So you have all these you know cumulative impacts of other barriers upstream of Strokes Felt that might be imposing um, you know kind of a top down control on how well. You know, you, the recovery can be achieved at Strokes Felt absent additional barrier removals upstream to further uh, restore the broader stream to its original connectivity. Um, but we still see, you know, connectivity, um, you know, uh, working. Um, I have pictures of blue crabs traveling up from the Hudson past where the old dam was. If wild brown trout moving through the reach, we have large spawning uh, female small bass moving up from, you know, the river and all of these uh, individuals would be, would have been, you know, were blocked prior to uh, 2020. Um, and eels too, I just didn't have an easy picture, but lots of eels. Um, so quickly, you know, to summarize the ecological benefits of dam removal in the Hudson, um, you know, you have locally restored hydraulic regimes that create quality, aquatic habitat through sediment transport mechanisms and aquatic connectivity increases in usable habitat, fosters colonization and utilization by stream organisms and improves species richness and promotes biodiversity. Greater, greater biodiversity provides ecosystem resilience by allowing more efficient uh, ecosystem functioning and, and resource utilization and reach level restoration improves water quality diversifies aquatic life uses and achieves management goals. So just a couple of slides of, of future insights. Um, you know, an Achilles heel of, of a lot of the dam removal research is a longer term perspective. And so, um, as I indicated, we went back to some of our sites that we began in 2016, um, just this past year in 2023. Uh, so, you know, can we identify long-term ecological behaviors in the context of dam removal that, you know, can help inform management decisions? Um, and so, 
you know, for instance, I've kind of highlighted two two uh, case studies uh, with respect to landscape context. So if we look at Chat Pond, um, you know, dam came out in 2016. You know, you had upstream, you had this initial blip of recovery, but then even looking at you know eight years out, you know, both of these you know upstream downstream locations, you know, you, you set it on this trajectory of continued improvement over time. Um, on the wine and skill, we didn't have pre-removal data, so I kind of predicted a value based on the average water quality score of multiple impoundments. And so, you know, there, which is, um, it's in Troy, it's a similar uh, landscape context to um, the Quasaya Creek case study. You know, you have this bump and then you know, but you kind of, as we saw in Quisaic, you know, it kind of asymptotes. It's just kind of, you know, your recovery kind of plateaus. And so, you know, is that necessary to set recovery expectations or help prioritize, um, uh, you know, your, you know, management removal decisions, um, you know, depending on which landscape context you want to uh, remove a barrier from. Um, and then, you know, you kind of your default do nothing approach, no action approach in Furnace Brook. Um, you know, you see that it's 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 essentially flatlined. I mean, there's some interannual variation, but again, you're in this arrested state of static impairment unless you know you have some mechanism mechanistic driver to to alter that. Um, and again, assessing the role of landscape context, you know, in post removal ecological recovery trajectories. You know, to, to aid in developing removal, you know, prior, you know, prioritization models. So, again, looking at our two case studies, you know, we saw you know excellent recovery in Japan, EPA success story. You know, you have a lot of contiguous forest, light agricultural, um, you know, low residential, low low road um, mileage, impervious surface. Quisaya Creek in Newburgh is about as opposite as you can get. Heavy urban, large development, industrial, pre-development, you know, post-development, uh, post-industrial development. Um, so again, how, if, as we can replicate across different landscape settings, you know, can we develop, you know, priority metrics that can uh, help us uh, predict outcomes of removal, you know, more accurately. So, I appreciate uh, the time. Um,